So eight years ago, I did this kind of crazy thing. Um, I had a summer which, which was totally booked uh, with uh, practicing a very difficult piece for percussion solo, James Dillon's uh, La Coupure. And now, La Coupure is probably the most canceled piece in the Western canon, and sure enough, right on schedule, the notice that our concerts in Strasbourg and Oslo had been canceled arrived, and I suddenly found myself with about three months of free time, and it was during the summer, and I wondered, what am I going to do with this time? And I then revisited this old desire that I had, which is to take a long walk, a long one-way walk, so that I was just heading in the same direction day after day. And I decided, in fact, to walk from the Mexican border near my house here in San Diego, California. And I eventually realized that I could, in the time I had, walk to San Francisco. Now, there were a couple of reasons for doing that. One was to sample the sounds of the California, uh, of California coast, to hear what basically this place I call my home sounds like. And there was an ul ulterior motive, which was just lurking in the back of my head at that point, which was that I lived here in San Diego, and my girlfriend Brenda lived in San Francisco, and I realized that I wanted to marry her, and I thought, well, if I walked up the coast to propose that Perhaps that might be a meaningful statement of my, my potential for commitment. And uh, fortunately, she said yes. It would have been a very long walk uh, back in any event if she hadn't. So I took six and a half weeks, and I walked from San Diego to San Francisco. It amounted to about 20 miles, 20 plus miles a day. And I went through all of the kinds of climates that you find in, in, in California, through cities, uh, through farming country, through some wilderness, and I heard, I listened to what California sounded like. I didn't listen to an iPod while I was walking. I didn't talk on the telephone. I didn't walk with anybody. I simply, every day, got up and walked as far as I could and listened. Well, you know, at first, I was just astonished. I didn't hear a single sound. At, at the beginning, I didn't hear a single sound that wasn't mediated by a machine. Sounds that were made either by people flying machines, driving them, talking into them, using them in some way or another. You know, through San Diego, the first days, I didn't hear the wind or the birds or the waves practically at all. It seemed as though we had created this mechanized sound world. And I later realized, when I did some research, that this is, has huge impact on the, on the biosphere. Birds, for example, that require a certain kind of frequency to be available to them in order to make mating calls, in some cases find that that frequency is occupied by cars, by the whine of tires. In some cases, this actually threatens their mating behavior, and that the birds who are successfully able to either raise or lower their mating calls to find clear acoustical space, in essence, are the ones that survive. Uh, it's astonishing to think of actually what the world of noise is doing to the animal and, and even the plant kingdom. And then, of course, we can apply it to ourselves and we see huge results. So the world of the city is a world that is mediated by machines. The world of the country, of the countryside, is a world that's also mediated by machines. But at least there, is, there are moments, brief moments, where you can hear, for a split second, a clear sound world. I brought a recorder with me. And there was at one point this uh, northern mockingbird, you know, one of the most vociferous of the songbirds that you can imagine. And it was outside a window and I was trying to sleep. It was the middle of the night and this thing was going crazy. So I thought, I'll get up, I'll take my recorder out and I'll make a, I'll capture this. Uh, and I wanted, in honor of John Cage, to make a four minute and 33 second recording of this bird. And I wanted that recording to have no sounds of machines in it. And it took me almost two hours in the middle of the night to make a clean 433 recording of the bird song, where there was not a car or a motorcycle or even someone's cell phone in the middle of the night that rang. And so when in the middle of the night, in the dead of night, we can't find not even four and a half minutes of silence, then you wonder exactly how deep in this um, flood of noise have we really, have we really gone. Anyway, that, that trip was amazing. First of all, it started kind of accidentally. I thought about walking for a very long time, but I hadn't made any plans, and one day I simply began to walk. It was the most purely Forrest Gump moment of my life. I didn't have a hat, I didn't have walking shoes, I didn't have water, I didn't have a backpack. I picked all of those things up along the way. 
So walking through San Diego was in itself not uh, an exceptional experience because I walk a fair amount in San Diego anyway. But the first amazing experience was walking through Camp Pendleton, the Marine Corps base just north of San Diego. Now, Camp Pendleton, if you know it, is what California actually looks like. It's California before people came and brought non-native plants and built towns and strip malls and, and movie theaters and things like that. So when you walk through Camp Pendleton, you're walking through essentially primordial California. Getting on the camp was another problem because, of course, there are military police who are stationed at the entrances, and I had to explain to a 19-year-old MP that I was walking through the camp to listen to the noises of California. He looked at me very suspiciously and finally let me on. But there you hear this kind of low hum of wind because the plants are not tall. It's a sort of scrubby chaparral through, through Camp Pendleton. It sounds extremely different than Orange County does, which is only slightly to the north. In Orange County, you have palm trees and condos and ways in which sound is deflected and refracted. There is a, a great deal of impurity in the sonic s signals because of all of that. Los Angeles even more chaotic with not only with machines and cars and planes and people talking to their cell phones, but the sounds of human language uh, itself. I remember stopping on a Los Angeles street corner where I could hear, I think, five different languages being spoken at once. So it was a way in which not only was I listening to the world, but I was understanding where I was in our historical and cultural moment while I was doing that. I continued up the coast. I had to cut in and out in the coast because of uh, military bases. I had to go around Vandenberg, for example, and cut in to San Luis, and then eventually ended up on the Big Sur coast and walked 140 miles or so along that magnificent stretch of coastline. Uh, many of you know that coast, and you know that the road ascends very slowly, very gradually, up and down about 500 feet at a time. So when you're walking that, it takes a couple of hours to climb these hills and a couple of hours, or say 90 minutes, to go back down. And when you're at the top of the hill, you hear birds and the wind, and you hear cars basically all the time. When you're at the bottom, you hear the waves. And so every two hours, it was as though someone had a huge mixing board and would replace the sound of the birds and the wind with the sound of the waves. And then I would start to climb again. The waves would get softer. The birds and wind would get louder. And after a while, that rhythm of changing the soundscape every three hours became this subtone, this subliminal, huge pulse to every day that I walked along that coast.